in the autumn, the villagers in Dungdor village are discussing building new houses the following year. Their major concern is timber. This is usually because their houses are old or rotten. But before being granted permission to take timber from the mountain forests, 13 village representatives must approve the improvement project. Based on the rules, Yoon C. Lee and 13 village representatives must carefully inspect the house to determine whether it's necessary to replace some wood or build a completely new dwelling. The traditional Tibetan houses in D.A. Bu have thick walls made of densely rammed earth that can withstand the elements. The inside is wooden and it's warm and clean inside. Joe Sao's house is at least 80 years old. It was passed down from her grandparents. The house retains its old character. She was born in this house. She often sweeps the floors in her free time. Her children and grandchildren now have their own families. Joe Sao lives in the Ajie village, surrounded by mountains. The valley is very quiet. Eighty years ago, an event that influenced the future of China took place here. Like countless other rivers in Dia Bu, the Dala River rushes towards the Bailong River across the steep valley. On August 29, 1935, after the first front of the Red Army left the grasslands, the troops walked along the Dalla River Valley towards Dia Bu. 
They entered the area through Zoika County in Sichuan. 80-year-old Tibetan Jiana Zhao vaguely remembers what happened that day. Joe Sao was still very young when the Red Army came to the village. On September 12, 1935, more than 30 party leaders, including Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, Jiang Wei-tian, and Bo Gu, sat around the Tibetan-style furnace in Zhou Sao's house. The meeting was extremely important to the Red Army. It prevented the possible division of the Red Army and strengthened the decision to march north against the Japanese. Lin Biao once convened a military conference under this tree, based on the decision of the OGA meeting to determine the marching route, which would be used to attack Lazako Pass. Occasionally, someone will come and visit kilograms of grain. Sungji's wife and daughter have gone to the fields. He cooks and looks after his grandchild. When his siblings left the house to set up their own families, he moved into his grandparents' house. Life is a struggle for the family. He wants to provide tourists with the type of noodles that Mao Zedong once ate as a way to support his family. His grandparents once cooked noodles for Mao. Sun Ji is very good at making them. After rolling the dough, cutting the noodles, and frying some bacon, he puts the noodles into the bacon grease. This was one of the few delicious dishes available to those who took part in the long march. This is the after the Red Army captured Lanza Go Pass, Mao and more than 20 bodyguards left Sun Ji's house. He walked across this narrow wooden bridge on the Bailong River and disappeared into the mountains.
The construction team is widening the road in the valley in the northeastern part of Diobu County. The rushing Laza River below flows to the Bailong River, tens of kilometers beyond. This is Lazako Pass, the last natural barrier on the route of the Red Army's long march. Today, it's a busy portal between the county and the outside world. From the Dala River Valley to Ajie, then from Wangzang to Lazako Pass, the Red Army marched for five days. They broke through the last natural barrier on their way north to fight the Japanese invaders. Those who offered help to them in the most difficult times have been remembered forever in history. After the Tibetan New Year, spring arrives. It's the season to build new houses. The DA Mountains lie between DA Bu County and Ju Omi County, like a row of high walls. The highest is Kormei Peak at 4,920 meters above sea level. It's popular with mountaineers. However, only the strongest can make it even to the foot of the mountain. To the north of Kormei Peak is Juoni County. The Tao River flows through the county, bringing life-giving water to the local people along the way. In the fourth month of the Tibetan calendar, the annual Arrow Festival takes place. The Tibetan villagers become busy and lively. Priests prepare butter and sampa as items of tribute, and women sing religious songs. carry arrows uphill and insert them into the ancient altar. These weapons are offerings to the god of the mountains to pray for his protection as well as for prosperity and wealth. <laughs> Gazang Droma is making wedding clothes for her niece with her mother and aunt. The Tibetan costumes they're making are very beautiful. It said that the Jew and I Tibetans ancestors were soldiers. Even to this day, the women's wedding hats look like cavalry helmets. Juoni County embraces more than 10 nationalities. The pastures are mostly on the gentler slopes. Farming and animal husbandry are both key sources of income here. This is Lulin Town in Juoni County. This photo was taken nearly 90 years ago by American botanist Joseph Rock. He described this place to readers around the world as a blessed land with the best forests and scenery in Gansu province. The chieftain of Ju Oni arranged a room for Rock at the Chunding Lamasari. The Lamasari is closely linked with the Tibetan living Buddha, Pagba, who ultimately incorporated Tibet into the Yuan Empire. He also created Mongolian script. 
Over a period of several hundred years, the Lamasery gained great respect and sent many eminent monks to preside and preach at Yonghe Lamasery in Beijing and Wutai Mountain Temples in Shanxi. There are many Buddhist treasures in the Lamasery. This bone accessory was once worn by the Tibetan Buddhist Mahasiddha Naropa in the 11th century. There are only two like it still in existence. This Buddhist statue made of ebony was given by Pagba as a gift to the Lamasery almost 1,400 years ago. The Lamasery was once known for its collection of books, most notably the Juoni version of the Tripitaka, 108 volumes of Kung Yur and 209 volumes of Tong Yur. Rock bought a set and shipped it back to Washington. It's still in the Library of Congress collection to this day. Day Ogo in Juoni County is where Tripitaka was block printed two and a half centuries ago. The abundant trees in the Day Ogo Mountains provided sufficient wood for the production of printing books. Legend has it that woodblock printing was brought to Ganan by Pagba from elsewhere in China. Before the Mongol armies conquered the central plains, Pagba traveled among Tibetan, Ando, and Han territories, bypassing Ganan several times. He made a huge contribution to making Tibet an indispensable part of China. Today, young Jane visits his grandfather's old house. His grandfather is a former Juoni chieftain. The old villagers from the nearby village give him a warm welcome. The old house has been converted into a primary school, leaving only the surrounding walls, the old cypress tree in the backyard, and a small wooded area where the children play. Almost 80 years ago, the house was owned by Young Zheng's grandfather, the 19th Juoni chieftain, Young Ji Qing. Juoni County has been paying allegiance to the central government since the Ming Dynasty. Its territory extended from Juoni all the way to Die Bu. In August 1935, a young reporter named Fan Chung Jiang from Tak Hung Pao newspaper met up with Young Ji Ching and discussed the current progress of the Red Army's long march in the anti-Japanese war. Soon, Yang Ji Cheng received a telegram from Gansu asking him to send 20,000 soldiers to help warlord Lu Da Cheng intercept and annihilate the Red Army in the canyon. Uh, the Dieboo 让红军顺利地通过。因为从我爷爷来讲,对红军的了解,主要是同情红军北上抗日。Two years later, all seven members of Chieftain Yang's family were killed for helping the Red Army. The remote district of Juoni County became more widely known to outsiders through reports in Ta Kung Pao.
There are many inkstone craftsmen in Juo Ni. Wang Yuming is one of them. He's a master craftsman from Gansu who has a unique feeling for stone. Tao River ink stones are collected from the riverside. During the Northern Song Dynasty, around a thousand years ago, they were given to the imperial court as a tribute. They were highly prized by famous poets and calligraphers. Jia is an old master of Tao River ink stones. Today he's going into the mountains with his partners early in the morning. His shoulders were injured recently, so he is unable to do any heavy lifting. Collecting stone is a very dangerous occupation. Although the elevation, steep slopes, and landslides pose great risk, there are still many stone collectors here due to market demand. Jia says that in the town, those with artistic talents engrave ink stones, while the ordinary people make a living collecting the raw materials. These days, it's becoming more and more difficult to find good stones. Sometimes they search a whole day and come up empty-handed. It's exciting to find a good one, but back-breaking work bringing it down the mountain. These exquisite ink stones are the result of the painstaking efforts of the Han and Tibetan craftsmen who live along the riverbanks. This is a story told by the people of Ghana about their hometown, their dreams lives and their destiny. <music> Saying goodbye to D.A. Boo and Ju Oni, the film crew approaches Lin Tan and Zhou Chu in Ganyan Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Why do the people here wear the costumes of southern China from 600 years ago? Are these people really Tibetans? Join us for part four of the nearest snow-covered plateau 